joining us now is Ojini Kaupe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Oji. Good morning, Dr. Vadi. Was there a particular reason you used my full name today? <laughs> Isn't that your I name? Just wanted to are you rejecting smile. your own name? I will not. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Tundun. How are morning. you? Great. Uh -huh. Good morning, Rafai. How are you? Morning, Aji. Great. Well, good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United Kingdom, Sasha Johnson, Black Lives Matter activist, who got shot in the head in the early hours of Sunday, is reported to be in critical condition at an intensive care unit. The Take in the Initiative Party reports that the attack came following numerous death threats as a result of her activism. And the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton, shared a heartfelt message praising nurses around the world for their role in combating the deadly coronavirus. COVID-19 has highlighted the vital role that nurses provide, which we all rely on. And it's made all the more extraordinary when we consider the huge sacrifices and personal demands that have been placed on all of you by the pandemic. Then, wedding bells. Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his fiancée, Carrie Simmons, have announced that their wedding will take place in July of 2022. In the United States, the YouTube sensational video, Charlie Bit My Finger, one of the most viewed videos in the website's history, has been auctioned off as a non-fungible token for a stunning $760,999. The video is now set to be deleted from YouTube. In Nigeria, photos and videos of the national flag and other flags at the presidential villa in Abuja flying at half-mast in honor of the late Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru, and 10 other military officers who died in a plane crash last Friday have made the round. And Nigerians call up British-owned clothing retailer Timbuktu Global on Twitter for trademarking the word Yoruba and preventing Nigerians from using the indigenous word in their business name. Under sports, after a stunning 33 goals for Jenk this season, 26-year-old Nigerian striker Paul Onwachu won the Belgian League Player of the Year and Golden Shoe Awards on Monday at the Pro League Awards ceremony in Brussels. And Tiger Woods has congratulated 50-year-old Phil Mickelson, who made history as the oldest man to win a golf major at the PGA Championship, bagging a whopping $12 million in price money. Finally, under entertainment, French fashion tycoon Bernard Arnold has overtaken Jeff Bezos to become the world's richest man with an estimated net worth of $186.3 billion. The French billionaire heads the luxury goods firm LVMH, which owns the likes of Louis Vuitton, Fendi, Christian Dior, and Givenchy, and its portfolio of over 70 luxury brands. Well, let's begin what's trending in Nigeria by recognizing robotic engineer Dr. Olushola Ayola, who has developed a carbon emission tracker drone for aerial surveillance in detecting hideouts of criminals within caves and forest areas. Dr. Ayola, who's the founder of Robotic and Artificial Intelligence Nigeria, Rain, an indigenous artificial intelligence firm based in Ibadan, the Oyo State Capital, is a first-class graduate of electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Ibadan. He has a doctorate degree in robotics and extreme environments from the University of Manchester. Dr. Ayola developed the device to assist in tracking insecurity in Nigeria and has appealed for assistance from the federal government to enable the intelligence firm expand its research and development initiative. I am so proud of this man, uh, Dr. Abati. When I read his story, I thought it was so fantastic. We have been talking about battling insecurity and finding out where these criminals um, hide. And I hope that there will be a way that, you know, the federal government will listen to his plea to try to help out. And, you know, maybe this is a way we can end insecurity. Nigeria. Well, most certainly. I mean, Dr. Ayola deserves and should get every support that yes. he needs. Uh, we're in the age of innovation. We're in the age of ideas. And certainly with the level that, uh, you know, uh, we're facing now, with the kind of situation we're facing with regard to the fight against uh, terrorism, Correct. Uh, Nigeria needs every help that he can get. Now, with regard to the use of drones, uh, 
you know, this is already part of the Nigerian military initiative. As far back as uh, 20, I think 2014, or thereabouts, or 2015, Nigeria was already talking about something they call Gurma, the Gurma drone, uh, which was supposed to help with uh, surveillance, reconnaissance, and uh, collection of uh, intelligence. Uh, a few years later, they were talking about UAV, uh, unmanned area, you know, uh, surveillance device. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I think that was uh, uh, in collaboration with a company in Portugal, Ichoku. They called it uh, Uchoku uh, UAV. And as recently as 2020, uh, the leaders of the Nigerian military were again talking about how they can use technology, drones, you know, to collect intelligence. So now we have a Nigerian uh, who is coming up with an idea, who has been educated abroad. So certainly, you know, is recommended, highly recommended for whatever level of support or collaboration or cooperation that the Nigerian authorities can have with him. And we have many Nigerians like that yes. who are into cutting edge technology, either it's robotics or artificial intelligence. The other day in Imo State, there was a young man who was shown, who was uh, showing how you could set up a grid, how you could generate electricity in an innovative manner. So we have talent. What remains is for those who lead us, those who are in critical sectors of the economy and government, uh, to operate at the level of ideas not sentiments, either ethnic, ethnic or religious or group, but to see these talents that are available and to harness their potentials, whether they are inside Nigeria or they are in the diaspora. Very well said, Dr. Avati. We'll have to go on a short break now. And when we return, what's trending on the morning show will continue. Stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show. We're still on What's Trending. Tindu, before we went on a break, we were discussing Dr. Ayola, who's developed this amazing uh, drone. I'm thankful for his yeah. ingenuity. And I want to refer to something that you wrote in today's um, This Day. You referred to the 2021 Global Firepower Index, our military ranking. And we're middling at best. We have clear limitations when it comes to recruitment, equipment, training. So this kind of initiative, these drones, will really help us. We need all yes. the help we can get. So this is really wonderful on many levels. I was very excited when I saw this story. Rafai, your take on this story. I mean, it's a good one. So, Oji, I'm, I'm not in doubt of Nigerians' capacity to develop yeah. drones and do good things in science. You know what I'm in doubt is? I, I, what I'm in doubt of is the fact that are they ever going to fund this? And I mean they, I mean the government. The federal government, he's appealed, will, yes. Will they ever fund this? Because we have millions of Nigerians that can come up with great products like this. But will they ever fund it? I mean, we heard of the story of some professor from a polytechnic or a PhD holder in 96 that developed a car and came to the federal government and was said that the sitting president then he made some commitment as regards it, but the money never got to the guy, so he never built the car. And Oji, you'll be surprised, many years down the line, except they can prove me wrong. I know that story. You will see yes. that this project will not see the life of day by funding by the federal government. Probably when it will get funding, will be some foreign agency that will just, you know, throw some lockdown on this guy and fund this project. Watch me. And I want the federal government to prove me wrong. If you want to prove me wrong, fund this project. But I can tell you for free, one year down the line, we'll come back here, by the grace of God, we'll talk, and we'll tell the listeners that they have not funded this project. We can take a bet on that, Oji, if you want. I don't, I, well, well, let's do it, because I'm, I'm hoping that they will fund this yeah. project, because this is really what we need in Nigeria to tackle uh, insecurity. We'll take another story. The indigenous people of Biafra has reportedly formed an alliance with a pro-independence movement in Western Cameroon known as the Ambazonia Governing Council, the separatist group IPOP, which has been seeking to break the southeast away from Nigeria to form an independent country, Biafra, is reported to have aligned with the Ambazonia Governing Council to exchange weapons and personnel to aid their breakaway agenda. The Ambazonia Governing Council, on the other hand, has been agitating to break the English-speaking Northwest and Southwest region from Cameroon. According to the Deputy Chief of the Council's Defense Forces, the group's alliance will also include joint operations and training. Dr. Abati, your take on the story. 
Okay, well, I don't think anybody should be surprised that uh, the indigenous peoples of Biafra trying to uh, join the Ambazonia Governing uh, Council. Now, we will need a little bit of history to put it in context. After the Treaty of Versailles, 1919, after the First World War, uh, Cameroon, which used to be under the control of Germany, was shared between uh, the British and the French. So you had a part of it that was uh, taken over as a, uh, a mandate territory by the French. And you also had the British mandate uh, territory, uh, the northwest and the southwest of, uh, of uh, Cameroon. Now, Nigeria was the colonial power in, uh, in uh, Nigeria. Uh, the British was the colonial power in Nigeria. So by 1954, the British were administering southern Cameroon, the northwest and the southwest, as an appendage of Nigeria. And indeed, in the Eastern Legislative Assembly, uh, representatives of uh, southern Cameroon were members of the Eastern Nigeria Legislative Assembly. The leader at the time was Dr. Endeli. Now, later, Dr. Endeli went on uh, in 1959, when the United Nations decided that you know, uh, those mandate territories were going to stand on their own. Because by 1958, the people of southern Cameroon were already asking for independence. They, they wanted to stand on their own. So Dr. Endeli uh, became the first uh, premier, it was called then, of uh, southern Cameroon. Now, in uh, 1961, when the UN decided that he didn't want uh, uh, any territory uh, to be kept in uh, trustees, uh, as a trustee, under UN Resolution 1608, now southern Cameroon now decided, uh, th there was a plebiscite decided to stand on its own to become part of a federation, the French uh, Cameroon Federation and the Anglophone uh, Cameroon uh, Federation to have equal rights to be semi-autonomous. So in 1961, uh, Endeli and Foncha and all those people from Cameroon, they decided to go and form a federation, right. a Cameroon federation. Now, but subsequently, by 1974, the, the Francophone part was beginning to dominate the Anglophone part. I'll cut the story short. Uh, by the last uh, five years, there had been a full civil war. War between the Anglophone side and the uh, Francophone side because the leaders of uh, Cameroon on the French side did not respect the terms of the Federation uh, resulting from the plebiscite of 1961. So what you now find is that the people of Amberland, as they are otherwise called, it is natural for them to want to identify with the people Another of side. Eastern Nigeria, Correct. who used, they used to be together. Now, what are the implications? They say they will share arms and ammunition. They say they will share intelligence. They say they will work together. I think that what is important is for the intelligence agencies in Nigeria to look at this. We've been talking about the proliferation of small arms and weapons Correct. in Nigeria. Is it the southern Cameroon part, northwest and southwest, that is the source of these weapons? Don't forget the northwest, they are also related to people in the northern part of Nigeria, or that part of uh, Adamawa uh, and all those states in the northwest. They are, they are aligned with their people in uh, Cameroon. In fact, some of them in uh, Ambazonia, they have uh, their bedroom inside Cameroon. They have their uh, <laughs> restroom inside Nigeria. That's a good so I that. think that this is a wake-up call Correct. for the security agencies in Nigeria. So if you have this alliance uh, on the northwest and also south, southwest uh, west of Cameroon, linking with the eastern part of Nigeria, I don't think anybody needs to call on the national security advisor or other agencies to say that this is a serious problem for Nigeria. It is. It is a wake-up call to uh, Tundu. What is your opinion on the alliance? Well, the in the Nigerian context, yeah. I always support and advocate for restructuring. It's too vital a step to skip and go straight to secession. However, I do understand the sentiments that drive people to want to secede. Nobody wants to be treated as second class anyway. It's intolerable. So I do agree with you that the government needs to look at the small arms proliferation, but also needs to address the fundamental issues underpinning this drive to secede. People need to be respected. People need to be included. A proper environment has to be created where there are no first class or second class citizens. That's really the bottom line here. 
And what is happening in Cameroon just goes to show that. I watch some of these documentaries and I'm appalled at the way English-speaking Cameroonians are treated like animals in their own country or what should be their own country. Correct. Rufai, your take on the story. That's why we always make the refrain, Oji, that leadership matters. Look at what is happening in Cameroon. It shouldn't have gotten to this stage if the Cameroonians and the government order Paul Bia continue the policies of President Ahijo in reuniting the French-speaking part and the English-speaking parts. But because of political gains, Paul Bia turned Cameroon for himself alone and his people alone and started marginalizing people from the English-speaking part. Because one of the agreements after independence, President Dahijo with the CNU party moved so hard at reuniting this part. And that's why we keep calling on leadership to unite the people. And how do you unite the people? You unite the people by listening to them. You listen to their grievances. The Yorubas have a saying that an elderly person that listen to one side of the story without listening to another is a terrible elderly person. So as the leadership here, you should listen to both sides and try to balance it out for peace and justice and equity to reign. And that's why you are shocked when you read the message of Galba Asheru in response to the 17 governors supporting open grazing in a time like this. Shocking. You took sides. Leadership matters. All right, Rafai, well said. We'll take our final story. On Monday, members of Garaka community in Niger State took to the streets to protest against the continuing spate of kidnappings in their community. The protesters said the gunmen abducted 15 persons in the early hours of Monday and were demanding that the government bring an end to the menace. Let's take a look. Adna Road, popularly known as Dumez. If you are traveling to Zaria, you are going to Kaduna Kano. This is the route that you follow. We are on the road here now, trying to mobilize and seek the attention from government to come to our aid. The rate at which kidnapper terrorizes us here is not too good. Look at us, we are by the road, no retreat, no surrender. We definitely take our own destiny by our hand. Yes, this is it. We are not resting. Government must surely come to our aid. No opening of the road. It is either government attend to us or we are not living here. Dr. Bati, this happened yesterday, it went viral, the video, I was appalled. I mean, these people, they stayed on the street for hours, they were burning tires. I mean, I, it's just really scary what's going on in Nigeria at this point. Well, this is the Gauraka community yes. of Niger State, very close to uh, Abuja. You recall that before now, Governor Sani Bello, the governor of uh, Niger State, raised the alarm, well, if I may use that phrase, about how 42 communities in uh, uh, Niger State have been taken over. And he pointed out that, look, uh, the uh, local government that have been taken over was just about uh, two hours away from Abuja. And that, you know, that, I guess that was his own way of drawing attention to how serious the insecurity situation in Niger State, next to the uh, Federal Capital Territory, had become. Yes. As we sit here today, uh, there are parts of Abuja where people are not uh, feeling safe anymore. Gauraka community is one of them. The other day, it was Buari community. Buari community where you have the Nigerian law school. Parents of students who were to sit for their final bar part two examinations, raised uh, alarm that they didn't want their uh, children to be exposed to uh, danger. I think we had a guest on this program who said, look, the uh, federal government should reconsider and the uh, Nigerian uh, law school should reconsider holding that exam. Okay, they had that exam. But since then, we have continued to see that people, even within the periphery of the uh, federal capital territory of Nigeria, are not safe. So these people in Gauraka uh, community in Niger State are just sent to the federal capital territory with about 30 persons having been abducted from their communities, decided to resort to self-help. Yes. And the gentleman speaking in that video said they took that decision in order to draw attention 
of government to the to the applied yeah. and to see if government could uh, come to their rescue. They are exposed to, uh, at the back end to uh, 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 terrorism threat in in, uh, in Niger State. Any any terrorist in Niger State can just move into those uh, communities within the perimeter periphery of uh, the federal we capital the territory. Where the Boko Haram so, had horses on I don't know. There. I don't want to say. Uh, you know, the standard thing is to follow the textbook and say nobody should resort to self-help. But these people are acting out of concern, out of anxiety, out of desperation, out of fear. They are expressing their agony. And I think that the Nigerian government should listen to them. No Nigerian should be subjected to this kind of uh, uh, frustration because uh, the welfare and the security of the people of Nigeria is a primary concern of government. If uh, it means the president has to summon another security council meeting, he can summon the meeting. In fact, the, the security council should begin to meet every day Very good. so that the people in Buari and Gauraka and other parts of Nigeria can have a sense of security. I thought it was important to highlight the story. Rufai, your final take on the story real quick. We can summon meetings all we want, but the question is, are people safe in Nigeria? When people are safe, they will not come on the road and protest in security. They will tell you they are safe. But can a Nigerian truly go to bed and sleep with both eyes? That's the cardinal question we should ask ourselves today. And if a Nigerian can't do that, then government should not sleep. Government should not sleep if its people can't sleep. The only time government should sleep, even with one eye open, is when his people can sleep well. All right. Very well said, Rufai. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abati. Well, Thank you, Tundu. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you very much, today. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Always a delight to see you. Thank you.